So Tana Koto Katoa, another wonderful Wednesday is almost over, but we are in for a delightful evening tonight with Elaine Franks, who will present tonight's webinar on eating disorders. Elaine is a consultant liaison nurse from the South Island Eating Disorders Service. Elaine trained in the UK and then has worked in the UK, Australia and New Zealand. For the past 12 years, Elaine has been support, education and liaison for the entire South Island. Wow. She also carries a caseload of patients with severe and enduring eating disorders, plus doing adolescence using modelase based family therapy. And I shall now hand you over to Elaine for this evening. Thank you. Hi, everybody. And thank you for allowing me to present to you tonight on eating disorders. Um, I do want to apologize for the amount of slides I have, but there is quite a lot to cover. Um, and I really miss seeing you guys and being in the same room as you because I can't see when you yawn or when you laugh, but hopefully you'll do both. Well, not the yawning, but the laughing. Okay, so uh, my name is Elaine Franks. I'm from the South Island Eating Disorder Service and I can't make my slides go forward. Oh, here we go. Um, so we're based here at the Princess Margaret Hospital in Christchurch under the umbrella of the Specialist Mental Health Service and um, we do cover the whole of the South Island. We work on a hub and spoke model to include all the regions from Invercargill, Dunedin, right up to Blenheim and um, Nelson. So what we offer to the regions is consult, support and admissions when required to the inpatient unit. We have an eight bedded inpatient unit, which we share with the mothers and babies. We actually have 7.5 beds, but that's a bit too complex to explain. But we share, we share the eighth bed with the mothers and babies. So those eight beds cover the whole of the South Island for inpatient admissions. Um, there is a liaison role within each region that, that you'll be aware of, hopefully. You'll have a regional liaison person which could be of great use to you and be useful for you to find out who that is. And if you need to know, I can let you know who that is. We also offer education and training. Um, we do Maudsley-based family therapy training every year and we do online training. Okay, we'll get on to eating disorders. So eating disorders are very complex. Um, there's serious mental illnesses, as you probably know, with significant life-threatening, both medical and psychiatric morbidity and mortality, regardless of an individual's weight. Around 60% of patients with eating disorders will have a comorbidity, which increases the complexity, as you can imagine. Anorexia nervosa has got the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder. And risk of premature death is six to 12 times higher in women with anorexia compared to the general population. I am gonna talk a little bit about males later on. There is not so many statistics about males, but there's more coming out. So I thought I'd start with the diagnostic criteria. There are, um, in the new DSM-5, there are new, newer criteria for diagnosis for anorexia, bulimia, OSFED, which is Other Specified Feeding and Eating Disorders. So that's a group of feeding disorders um, that's there for us to use that title for if they don't quite meet criteria for anorexia or bulimia. They're no less serious. Used to be called EGNOS under DSM-4. ARFID is the Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. So these are the picky eaters that um, were highlighted and have been highlighted in the media over the past few years and binge eating disorder. So just to have a quick peek at what they might look like. So with anorexia nervosa, there's a significant loss of body weight um, and an inability to um, have a new, um, an adequate nutritional intake associated with that. So there's an intense fear of weight gain, body image disturbance, they're very often seeing themselves as the largest person in the room. Amenorrhea is not in the criteria, but I've put it there because it was quite complicated before it was taken out um, because we had problems with, with girls that were having primary amenorrhea through their age rather than secondary through the eating disorder. Also, boys don't have periods, so it was difficult. So it's really good for us that it's come out, um, but it's also helpful in identifying anorexia because it's there. So there are two types of anorexia nervosa, restricting and binge purge subtypes. So the binge purge subtype is the most dangerous um, eating disorder of all. So as well as restricting, they also binge and purge usually by vomiting. And when I say binge, they're very subjective binges. And cognitive inflexibility is their prevalent thinking style. 
With bulimia, the recurrent periods of binge eating, um, objective, objectively binging. So um, an objective binge would be something like a family-sized tub of ice cream or a whole loaf of bread or four McDonald's servings. Um, so something that's unusually large. It's eaten in a, in a short period of time, so usually within an hour with a huge sense of loss of control and recurrent compensatory behaviours. So the compensatory behaviour is to compensate for the amount of eat they've eaten during the binge. So when we talk about compensatory behaviours, it's usually been uh, purging by vomiting, by laxative abuse, by diet pills, by diuretics, and on occasion we've seen bloodletting and of course exercise. There is that distinct sense of loss of control and the frequency is once a week for three months to meet that diagnostic criteria. And self-evaluation around themselves is, is very much influenced by their weight and shape. So the RFID, the avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, the picky eaters, so it's a feeding disturbance around um, lack of interest, um, maybe around the sensory characteristics of taste, smell, texture, um, or consequences, uh, adverse consequence of um, eating, either they've experienced choking or vomiting in the past. So they're not meeting their nutritional needs, a significant weight loss, nutritional deficiency, often enteral fed or on oral supplements. So it's not explained by lack of food or culture, um, doesn't occur during anorexia or bulimia, and it's not um, due to a medical condition. Okay, so then we talk about binge eating. I'm so sorry, this is in a different type. I don't know how that happened. Um, so binge eating disorder is quite similar in a lot of ways to bulimia without the compensatory behaviors, but there's no control over consumption of food. Um, and they feel that they still feel that huge sense of loss of control and um, shame and guilt when they've eaten. They often eat around emotion, emotions when they're depressed or bored and large amounts of food, even when they're not really hungry. OK, so what are the good things, if you can have any good things, the prognostic good factors about an eating disorder? So if it were to develop at a young age, it's the first episode and it's short duration. The body weight is relatively preserved instead of a massive weight loss. The family's intact. They've got other established roles such as hobbies, friendship groups, work, finances, church. They've got other things in their lives and the absence of a comorbidity. Those are good a good place to start if you've got that. If you've got this, it's not so good. So you've got purging anorexia by one of the vomiting diet pills, laxative abuse. They've had it for longer than six years. There's alcohol and drug dependence. There's a comorbidity, especially around personality disorders and an unrelenting lack of insight. Who's most at risk? So biologically, Although we're seeing that there are more males presenting with eating disorders, you are still more at risk if you're a female, you've got the genetic makeup, so you've got um, a family member with an eating disorder or another mental illness. There are lots of genetic components that make you more susceptible. So being premature is, is a susceptibility, um, but it's a whole range of genetic and neurological makeup. And of course, if you're at the age of prevalence for developing an eating disorder, which is about between the age of 12, 13 to about 16, then you're more at risk. The psychologically risky people are those with low self-esteem, anxiety, depression, and the personality traits of perfectionism being driven um, to succeed, OCD, stress, the overvaluation of body image and trauma. Oh, I thought I'd put this in to break up the monotony of the, of the slides. This is a, trying to break a few myths for you that you've probably seen this. So people do say families cause eating disorders. Um, they're not serious, they're a lifestyle choice. Um, they're a cry for attention, dieting's normal. Um, they only affect white middle-class females, particularly adolescent girls. They're all busted, they're not true. Um, I would sit and read all those truths, but we'd probably be here for longer. So what are the warning signs? What might you see of somebody that's experiencing or developing an eating disorder? Obviously, the first thing you might come across is seeing that they're losing weight 
or questioning, you might find that their, their um, menstruation has ceased. Um, they're feeling faint and dizzy on standing. They're feeling tired and they're sleeping poorly. They're cold. They've got cold hands and feet. They may be developing lanugo, which is the fine downy hair, which begins to cover the body in starvation. It's a protective mechanism the body puts into place to keep healthy warm. They may start developing hyperkeratinemia, which is orange palms and orange fat folds in the face. So this is caused by the inability of the liver to metabolize food colorings in foods that they frequently eat, which are, uh, which is pumpkin, carrots, the orange fruits. The psychological warning signs, they become preoccupied with eating. They're in the kitchen, controlling what's being cooked, controlling the contents, reading the backs of packets. They will be in charge in the kitchen um, and when you're shopping. They may be cooking, they may be wanting to cook. It's quite frequent for, for a person with an eating disorder to want to bake for everybody other than themselves. We get lots of presents of cakes here in the outpatient service. Decreased concentration, which is, which is what you'd expect. We all get a bit hungry prior to lunchtime. They have this ongoing starvation feeling of poor concentration. Their mood drops, they're socially isolative because lots of social activities take place around food or needing to be in the moment and needing to be engaged with your friends. There'll be evidence of anxiety around meal times and, and talk of food being good or bad. So um, carbohydrates and fats are very often the bad food. So pasta is bad and apple is the good food. Some of the behavioral warning signs that you might see are dieting. So we know that the biggest thing to kick off an eating disorder is dieting, um, counting calories. And there are lots of apps today on phones and watches and, um, Avoiding certain food groups, usually the carbohydrates and the fats. Eating in private, increased trips to the bathroom after eating, the compensatory behaviours again. Changes in clothing style to cover up the weight loss, often baggy clothing, excessive exercise and very secretive behaviours. So remembering that eating disorders are secretive, shameful um, illnesses that people try to hide. Saying they haven't eaten um, when they saying they have eaten, sorry, when they haven't, hiding uneaten food in lockers and bags, throwing it out of the window, purging into bags and throwing it out of the bedroom window. The socio-cultural risks um, that we see are adapting to Western beauty ideals of thinness and leanness. So people in our very transient world, when it was transient prior to COVID, with people coming into the country from different parts of the world and um, adapting to our, this thinness ideal that we have in an attempt to fit into their peer group. So going on a diet. Societal pressure to achieve, which I feel is huge um, in our society in this day and age. Involvement in a sport with a high focus on body weight. So things like ballet dancers, rowers, they have to conform to often to a weight limit, um, which they find very difficult. Peer pressure, teasing, bullying when based on weight and shape. Social media platforms. Um, so these, a lot of studies coming out of Australia at the moment around the use of Tumblr. Um, trying to think of all the ones that are here. Instagram, Facebook. Um, and how they link into what you've looked at, what adverts come up. Um, yeah. And troubled family and personal relationships. Although we never place any blame on the family for the child having an eating disorder, if there is troubled, if there are difficult relationships, they will have an impact. So as I said, I'm gonna talk just a little about eating disorders in males. When I first started out in eating disorders many, many years ago, um, we would probably see uh, less than one in 10. So, and, and even in the last, up until about the last four or five years here, we would have 10 females for every male. Um, but now there's, there's an increase. Um, so suggesting that males make up around 25% of people with anorexia and 40% of people with binge eating disorder. And in a recent study, lifetime prevalence for anorexia and obesity in adolescents aged 13 to 18 found no difference between males and females. 
How it starts is quite different. So for females, they have a desire to be thin because thin is the idea in our social grouping. Um, with males, they want to develop that um, Superman um, triangular image that wasn't there when I was young. Superman was just straight up and down, but now he's sort of triangular with this massive bulk. So that's what they're trying to do. And to achieve that, they begin to engage in compulsive exercises as, as a compensatory behavior, often with the aim of just achieving that muscular, not slender body style. The cognitions quickly catch on, quickly um, become anorexic, um, good foods, bad foods, unable to stop exercising, weight loss, anorexia. So what happens? What are the common health presentations? Emotional problems, weight loss, gastrointestinal. So the gastrointestinal is mostly around the slowing down of the metabolism for, to give the stomach time to gather every bit of nutrient it can once, you're, once the food is in the stomach. So the metabolism slows down, constipation kicks in and won't be resolved until the body's weight gained. Infertility issues, again, the body is so clever, it closes down all these pathways, doesn't release estrogen if, estrogen if there's not enough nutrition on board, period, stop. Long term, that will cause fertility problems. Short term, we can overcome it with weight gain. Injuries caused by overexercising. So when I go and do a talk at the local gym, they say, oh my goodness, this person keeps coming and coming and coming, and they don't appear to be able to stop exercising even when they're when they're injured because they, the exercising is not over-exercising, it's compulsive exercising. Fainting, dizziness, feeling fatigued, not sleeping well, feeling cold, um, swelling around the jowls, the cheeks here with the parotid glands that get inflamed and irritated um, through the overproduction of saliva due to purging by vomiting. So we're looking at calluses along the knuckles where people will bite down to perch, um, damage to teeth and bad breath or signs of vomiting too. Um, I've mentioned lanugo and hypokeratinemia, so I've talked about those. So the cues to diagnosing anorexia are those. So again, weight loss. We look at centile charts rather than using a BMI for young people. So we want to see um, we would try and glean as much information from the GPs as we can when the nurses have done weight and height, what their projectiles were, um, what centile they were on, where they've dropped off, and we need to get them back up again. So BMIs in people under 18, we don't use. Um, secondary amenorrhea, um, bradycardia, so a slow heart rate. So what we're seeing is the body again searching for nutrition and it finds it in muscles because there's no body fat left. So it will find nutrition in muscles and we will digest our own muscles um, looking for energy. And that means the heart will become small and floppy. It will slow down, the blood pressure will drop. It doesn't have the same capacity to beat. We're looking at hypothermia, peripheral cyanosis and the lanugo. I think I've mentioned lanugo three times now. Um, so in particular in bulimia, we're looking for those um, swollen parotid glands, the dental erosion, the scarred area on the back of the hand, and that yo-yo weight pattern that is quite typical of bulimia. Often don't look underweight, but the damage on the inside is equal in a lot of ways to um, anorexia. So we don't judge people on size because people can become quite ill even if they look normal weight and shape and hypokalemia, which is the loss of potassium through vomiting um, or through laxative abuse um, and hypokalemia causing um, irregularities of the heart, arrhythmias. So these may be some of the medical complications that require hospital admission to your local general hospital. We use our local general hospital here in Christchurch. We don't have the capacity on seaboard to monitor, um, for example, telemetry, to replace fluids. Um, so we have a really good liaison um, with Christchurch Hospital with the physicians. Um, part of my job is to, to go and keep the, keep the, the good, goodwill going. Um, they, it is complicated for them to manage our patients in that setting and they get quite anxious. People get very anxious about people with eating disorders. 
Um, but we reassure them that, you know, they're here to be medically stabilized. You do know how to do this. And that's what we want. That's all, all we want. Um, so these are the things that might take somebody to hospital is that severe malnutrition. So they've got a BMI of less than 13. They've had a really rapid weight loss, say more than four kgs in six weeks, severely dehydrated. Their bloods are highly unstable. Their potassium is below 2.5. The QTC on the ECG, and I don't want to give lots of um, abbreviations here. And I'm, if you don't, don't, if you don't know what a QTC is, it's the length of the heartbeat, which becomes prolonged um, in starvation. It becomes prolonged to the extent that the heart can eventually forget to beat again, and then we develop an arrhythmia, which can be fatal. So any dysrhythmia and bradycardia of a heart rate of less than fifty or standing, lying standing differential greater than 30 just shows us that the heart muscle is, has gone. So this is the biggest thing, I guess, in the medical implications of an eating disorder. Eating disorders affect every um, organ of the body from the skin, to the hair, to the eyes, to the liver, to the kidneys, to the heart. Um, but the cardiovascular risks um, worry us quite a lot. So they develop a small hypertrophic heart muscle. They're fatigued, or they've got a decreased exercise tolerance, um, muscle loss, which you can detect on a squat test or even just getting up from a sitting position or bed, hypertension, bradycardia, cardiac arrhythmia, um, their electrolytes are abnormal and they're hypothermic. Um, so the other physical complication is, is constipation due to low calorie intake, chronic laxative abuse and hypokalemia. Again, it's aggravated by the use of stimulant laxatives and treatment is education and trying to switch from, from those stimulant to non-stimulant laxatives and then to try and stop them altogether. Osteoporosis is a, is a big problem in the long-term prognosis for eating disorders due to the low estrogen and high hydrocortisone levels. Um, so when early onset of amenorrhea, peak bone mass, mass won't be achieved. So during the ages of um, 14 to 24, we put down a third of our bone stores. So we have to do it in that time. And unfortunately, that's the time when people develop eating disorders. So if we don't do it then, we can't play catch up later. So what we're doing is using that as a motivational tool for them to regain the weight now and carry on achieving bone growth. This is, um, this is the scoff test and it came out of a London teaching hospital. I've just popped it in here because it might be quite useful for some of you if you haven't seen it. Um, there should be some black letters in here that I haven't put. So it's the, the S out of the, anyway, it's the scoff test. Um, so these are questions you might pop into the conversation. I certainly wouldn't use them as a tick board, but um, do you ever make yourself sick because you feel full? Do you worry about um, losing control over how much you eat? Have you recently lost more than one stone? Very English. Um, six check kgs in a three month period. And do you believe yourself to be fat when others say you're too thin? Um, and would you say that food dominates your life? So for if they get two positives, it warrants further exploration. It's just quite a useful tool if you're feeling a bit unsure. Um, but it, it's not doesn't replace an assessment. So it's just an indication that oh, maybe there is something going on here that we need to look at further. So what should you do if you think somebody does have an eating disorder? I would say seek some help early. I understand that a lot of you are in rural areas and not part of a bigger team, maybe. But I would be suggesting you find out who that regional liaison person is in your area. And I can quite easily tell you off the top of my head who all of them are in the South Island. Um, and they've mostly been in their roles for a long time. They know the referral pathway. They're very experienced in managing eating disorders. They are complex for you to manage in those rural areas. You need to probably get a really good um, liaison going with your GP and practice nurses. They are going to be lifesavers for you when you're really concerned about this person, whether they're young or old. Um, so do the scoff test, see if your fears are confirmed. If it's a young person, make sure you're involving the family. Um, it's really important to involve the family if it's a young person. If they um, are going to do Maudsley family therapy, the family will be involved. 
Um, and they're the people that are going to help that young person get better. Put in, get, get some information from the regional liaison person, put in a referral to us. We can give you lots of support, lots of advice. If an admission to our service becomes necessary, we can help you around the pathway to that. But I would say your, your, your best liaison person is your GP and the practice nurses. So early recognition. It's really widely researched that there's this window of opportunity for young people that we shouldn't miss. And, and hence my job in, in a 2010 white paper was identified that schools and GPs and other people need to have the necessary education to see, to identify these people that have got an eating disorder, refer them to the right service and get treatment so recovery is possible. So it improves outcomes drastically. So treatment initiated within the first three years of an eating disorder has 60 to 75% chance of recovery. There should be a little arrow in between that because if we see them in the first year, there's about an 80% with Maudsley that family therapy chance of recovery. So if they don't get any treatment until adulthood, the recovery prognosis reduces to about 30 to 40%. And if they're not treated, um, they develop a severe and enduring eating disorder, the risks become much higher, the mortality rate becomes higher, and the recovery drops to around 20%. So in summary, patients with eating disorders present very complex challenges. Um, and treatment involves careful monitoring of those physical parameters and psychological support is always needed. I haven't talked about individual psychological support. Um, I didn't want to be teaching treatment, but um, there, there's a lot of evidence that any treatment can work for the right patient. So it's, you know, it's not CBT will work for this person. SSCM might work for this person. It's about mostly around the engagement. Some people recover just by um, addressing the problem and coming to a service. Weight gain is always a priority. So now I'm going to go on to talk about the differences for adolescents. So later in the year, I'll be talking about severe and enduring, but tonight I just wanted to focus a little bit on the big differences for adolescents. When we get adolescents, they may not have a fear of fatness. They may not have been fat. They may not have been overweight. So they don't know what it feels like. And that endorsement of that fear may only come once weight gain starts. They may not appreciate any of the risks, medical risks associated with extreme weight loss. They might say they're still having periods, but they might be only light or irregular. Um, and they may, they may even look as if they're in the healthy weight range, but they may need to sit at a higher weight or they may have lost weight rapidly. So there's a bit of a problem here is if you imagine you yourself as a 15 year old at school and your set point, which is genetically where you're programmed to sit weight wise is 70 kgs. Your best friend sits at 50, naturally. She's not on a diet, you're not on a diet. That's the difference. But there's so much pressure in our, in our society to conform that this girl who's 70 kgs wants to be 50. By the time she's got down to 50, she goes to the GP because mum's thinking this isn't right. And the GP goes, oh, but she's in a healthy weight range. But actually she's lost 20 kgs, which is a huge percent of her body weight. And she may well, she may well need to sit at 70, which is gonna be hard for her, but she's not gonna be healthy unless she sits at that weight. So it's complex and they don't necessarily fit the criteria set down by DSM Apple 4. That was a mistake, should be fine. So eating disorders represent the third most common chronic illness in adolescents after obesity and asthma. Adolescents with diabetes type 1 have a 2.4 times higher risk of developing an eating disorder. And it's also the most dangerous eating disorder. So at a time when adolescents are individuating with type 1 diabetes, so, I don't know, 14 years old maybe, and mum's saying, yes, you can give your own insulin now. The girl with the eating disorder storm in her head going on quickly realises if she doesn't give, her, give herself her insulin, she's going to pee out all her sugar. So she's going to lose weight. She may also lose her eyes, her arms, her legs. So this is where the difficulty arises. Adolescent girls who die at a high level are 18 times more likely to develop an eating disorder within six months. And studies now coming out of Australia show that around 70% of adolescent girls have body dissatisfaction. 
So it's a bit of a perfect storm. And I've just noticed I've missed a few things out of the perfect storm. So I've got perfectionism, low self-esteem, they're an adolescent, they're over-exercising, they've got a few OCD traits, highly anxious, high achiever, Western culture, they've gone on a diet, but they've also got the genetics here. They've also got a bit of COVID lockdown here, which highly um, made a lot of people highly anxious. I think in Christchurch, we've got a bit of those girls coming through now that were at a very vulnerable age during the Christchurch earthquakes. Um, they were five, mum was anxious, they developed an anxiety. I think, I think that fits in there as well, somehow. Um, okay. Oh, no, I've done something wrong. What have I done wrong? No, sorry, <laughs> apologies. <laughs> Social media, I didn't miss one in between. No, I did the perfect storm. Social media. We've done quite a lot, a lot of looking at this. We had a, a lovely student social worker here who did a bit of a study on the ward. She found that some of the really harmful sites and the girls get really drawn into these. They post pictures of themselves. Um, the pro-ana ones, um, so the pro-anorexia. Um, Thinspiration, Fitspo, really harmful sites, um, telling people how to lose weight, how to vomit more, how to, yeah, do every, sew weights into your bra. Um, yeah. Um, and we need to be asking them, what are you looking at? How helpful is it for you? It's a big part of what's happening in today's world. Sometimes we can miss an eating disorder. Um, oh, I have a little note about this anyway. Um, sorry, that's <laughs> in my disorganization. Sometimes they say, they can say the right things, they talk the talk, but they can't, they can't change. So they might know they're a bit underweight and they might say they want to gain weight or they claim to be naturally thin, or as we talked about on paper, they have a normal BMI, um, or they've lost weight, but they're still in the healthy weight range. And also there's another myth here. He's a boy, he's Maori, he's Pacific Islander. It's unlikely he'd have one, but no. There is, no, there is no discrimination around males, females, religion, culture, socioeconomic. Everybody is vulnerable to an eating disorder. But we need to look at what they do and not what they say. Um, as I said before, the fear may only begin to come out once weight gain has commenced. So what do you, what, how do we work out what is likely to be their healthy body weight? So where might they sit um, naturally? Um, they might be a higher BMI. How much exercise are they doing to, to use up the nutrition that they're taking in? Again, look at the previous heights and weights and have they fallen off that centile? Oh, I'm sure I had another little bit of paper here about this idea. So, that's all right. Okay, so what's the treatment? The treatment, the treatment, the treatment for adolescents is the gold standard treatment, Morsley based family therapy. Um, around 80% recovery. And we use it up until the age of 18, even over the age of 18, if they're still living with family and they're still engaged with family and we'll allow that to happen. It's the best and only treatment. Some families will come to us and say, yeah, but he's so individualized, he won't do what we say. That's the eating disorder more than the child or the family. It's the eating disorder, not letting him do what they say. So we have to go back to basics and empower the parents to bring about the recovery of their child. So in bulimia nervosa, we still look at um, Maudsley family therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, um, binge eating disorder, CBT and or individual, but there's always family wrap around with these young people. Um, and even with the avoidant food, restrictive food intake disorder, CBT, and the individual with family. Um, so the Maud, I'm reading this bit actually, so excuse me, but the Maudsley approach can mostly be construed as an intensive outpatient treatment. So it is outpatient treatment where parents play an active and positive role in order to help restore their child's weight to normal levels expected given their adolescent's age and height. Hand the control over eating back to the adolescent and then encourage normal eating. So that's in a nutshell what Maudsley Family Therapy is. It, it's broken up over a year, so they will have an appointment with us weekly for a year. 
<laughs> there are people trained in Maudsley in your region. You may have to find them or you may have to come and do your training, which would be lovely. Um, so phase one is the longest part of treatment and usually lasts six to eight months. It's about intensive refeeding, about coaching mum and dad with the child in the room about what they need to eat. Parents know what their kids need to eat, so they just have to get back to that. Um, anorexia will shout and scream and be in the room, but parents just have to show they're going to carry on and on and on, and it's going to get very boring. And parents can be quite powerful without realising, right, without realising, you know, you cannot go to school until you've had your breakfast, and you cannot go out and socialise until you've had this. So it gets boring. But as, as we move up, and up to treatment, so we get back to um, where they should sit in the healthy weight range, which we calculate um, to phase two, which is a transition back to the appropriate age um, adolescent control. So if you've got a 12 year old, it might be preparing their lunch, their cut lunch to take to school. If you've got a 17 year old, it might be them preparing their own breakfast and maybe their own dinner sometimes. Um, so it depends on the age, but that, that transition back to giving that the adolescents more control and seeing how they go with it. The appointments drop to fortnightly. If they can maintain their weight and continue growing, then that's fine. Then eventually we'd move into phase three in about the last month, which is just a one monthly appointment to address other issues of um, anxiety or depression or any other adolescent issues that have arisen that we don't deal with in phase one because it's Difficult to deal with when somebody is malnourished and in starvation and needs refeeding. Often if there's anxiety and other things going in phase one, by the time they've reached um, a healthy weight range, they will have disappeared. So a lot of those problems will disappear naturally, which is what we prefer them to do. Um, okay. Sometimes things don't go according to plan um, and we do need to um, admit to Seaward. So the NICE guidelines that come out of the UK and all the guidelines really, both from New Zealand, Australia and the UK, recommend outpatient treatment. That's the best treatment, outpatient treatment. Hospital is there at the, end of the, at the bottom of the cliff, um, but it doesn't cure anorexia. So it's used in order to medically stabilize patients and establish regular eating if unable to gain weight in an outpatient setting using family therapy. Sometimes the anorexia is too hard, mum and dad are burnt out. We're not seeing any weight gain in the first three to four weeks of treatment, we will admit to get them going. But parents, even in an inpatient setting, um, parents will be really on board with that. They'll be choosing their menus whilst they're an inpatient. They'll be involved in all the care um, so it's not ideal, but sometimes we need it to kickstart treatment. Hospital doesn't cure anorexia. It's only one part of the overall treatment. Um, and research shows recovery can only occur in the outpatient setting. I really had an important note. Oh yeah, I know what it was. Um, so the admission rate, so around 30, this is for the South Island, around 30% of our cases here, outpatient cases, only 30% need an admission to Seaward. So the remainder, the, the other 70% of our assessments um, recover in outpatient therapy only. Um, and um, yeah, the particularly hard ones do tend to come round again. Often one admission doesn't do it, but by the time they come for a second one, they, they do usually do it by the second one. I've got all these pieces of paper here. It's a nightmare. Um, I guess, yeah. The other thing I wanted to talk about was how we manage it in, in your particular setting, in non-specialist settings. Um, and I know we've already... Um, Oh, something fell off on my screen, I can't get rid of it. Um, so services really working together to provide care. So having good liaison with your local general hospital, your local psych hospital, your local GP, finding out who that regional liaison person is and linking in with our service. It's, you need to be, we're lucky here. I've got somebody next door. I've got a whole team to back me up, but you guys are out there often on your own worrying about somebody with anorexia because they look worrying. So getting the GP back on board for, for monitoring if um, increased weight loss or increasing those physical symptoms and working really closely with them. Um, 
what's the level of medical monitoring you might think you need on the treatment plan to try and manage that risk and get mum or you know, the family to adhere to those boundaries? Because sometimes if they won't, you have to end treatment. If, if, if you can't get the family on board, you're carrying a risk that you can't identify. Sometimes we have to let people go and get more unwell, which sounds awful, um, before they recognize the need for treatment. Being mindful of destabilization of emotions, exacerbation of self-harm if that's present or suicidal ideation. Um, sometimes the eating disorder has got a real, um, it's got a control focus. And if you take that away and they're getting better, the other things can go a bit destabilized. We do use the Mental Health Act from time to time. Um, we, do, we do save lives when we need to, utilising the Mental Health Act. We don't choose to. It doesn't do well for engagement, but we do have to at times. So I would be saying to you, get, at least get the GP to do a baseline assessment of weight, height, BMI, ECG, pulse, hydration, blood pressure, temperature, respiration, squat test, menstruation, full blood count and biochem. If you've got those at the outset and then you're concerned that no weight gain is happening, you're having weight loss, they're more symptomatic, then these can, some of these can be redone, especially the blood, the blood pressure, things like that. And you can measure them against them to see what's going wrong, to see if you need a hospital admission. If, and, and again, during treatment, if there's further weight loss, if they become more symptomatic, um, if medical instability is identified at assessment and that so the GP does the baseline, he finds out they're, they're neutropenic, so they've got a low white cell count um, or they're dehydrated. So if he's able to identify things at assessment, then he may need to see them. Yes, I need to redo these bloods in a month's time. But don't be afraid to stop them if this person's gaining weight. You don't need to be doing them every week um, if the person is gaining weight and becoming better if they increase their purging by vomiting, exercise or laxative abuse and, and asking for medication review. Sometimes people, um, especially families, we've had people in, in the rural areas of, of um, the South Island find it really difficult financially to take their child to the GP when they live in one area and the GP is here and the, the therapist is here. It's, it's quite difficult, but there are some... Um, uh, allowances um, available. Here it is, that's what I'm looking for. So the National Travel Assistance Scheme, um, that's one that's definitely available and disability allowance if it's a long-term um, disability. So finances can get in the way, non-attendance for various reasons, fear of weight gain, declining to be weighed. Um, these are things that, that you're gonna struggle with um, as we struggle with here, but maybe um, Putting those things in black and white at the outset can help and not um, feeling that you failed if, they, if these things don't happen. Um, oh, I did some questions for you that I'm not going to ask you. Um, so the other thing, I was going to talk about the voices because I, I think I just assume that everybody knows what I know. So I'm not sure if any of you have heard of the eating disorder voice that people with anorexia especially um, experience. So it's a voice in their heads um, that gives a running commentary in a very negative way about what they're eating or planning to eat. It's not as um, a hallucination. So it's not an external voice, it's a running commentary saying you're a bitch, you don't deserve it, don't eat. And it's repetitive and it goes on and on and on. Having some understanding of those psychological things that are going on can be quite helpful. Um, and I have a lot of handouts that I'm quite happy to send out to any of you if they're going to be useful. Um, my email address is on here. I would advise if you've got any funds in your, in your budget for, um, for this, this is the Medical Management of Eating Disorders. Can you see that? <laughs> it's listed on there. It's a really good book and handy to have on your shelf. Um, NEDC.com.au is the Australian eating disorder website that I use a lot. It has um, loads of resources. Um, and I'm here four days a week. Um, and I'm not sure if you have an equivalent to health pathways um, in your areas, um, but that will also give you medical parameters um, 
in terms, if you go under mental health and then look under eating disorders, all the medical parameters will be there. And I think I've nearly finished. So if you've got any, I'm really amazed that I finished in time because I felt as if I've got 101 slides and I was never going to finish. Um, so please, if you've got any questions, don't, don't think they'll be silly. Don't think, um, yeah, absolutely love to hear your questions and to answer them for you. Oh, thank you, Elaine. You're amazing. You did so well. See, you can just imagine, you can feel the warmth of everyone coming at you. And we've got some questions for you. So if you want to make yourself nice and comfortable, we yeah. should give you some questions. Okay. So I'll start, I'm going to start with this one because it just reflects back to what you were just saying about the health pathway. Yeah. Someone has said for the lower, for the lower South Island, health pathways referral method was changed about two years ago now private options only for patients is there now public options options through Christchurch based please and query query via ERMS query query so uh, oh that was a funny noise um you can refer to our service um what I would suggest is you find out who your regional um, liaison person is. We receive, receive referrals. Um, I don't know if they come through Health Pathways, um, but you can send them direct to us. But but that's better if it's done through your regional liaison person. It's not a we yeah we accept referrals from the whole of the South Island um, for liaison and support. I don't, does that? I I don't understand the health pathway set up, especially in Dunedin. Like we've all got our little quirks, eh? Um, what is the waiting list time to be seen in Canterbury? If you live in Canterbury, so we don't um, prioritise Canterbury over any other region. To us, Christchurch and Canterbury is a region. So we um, triage, so all of our referrals come through GPs. They don't go to single point of entry, they come to us. We triage them in accordance with acuity, need and age. So I guess to say that if you're a young person, first presentation and you're losing weight and your medical parameters aren't good, you will be seen relatively quickly. I can't put a time limit on that. Our referrals, we, we have had such an increase in referrals Historically, if we had somebody, a 14 year old, we would have seen them within two weeks. I can't guarantee that. We write to the GP once we've received the referral and ask them to continue medically monitoring them till we can pick them up. Sometimes we will see people more, even more urgently if they're on the pediatric ward at Christchurch Hospital where sometimes they have to go for medical stabilization, but I can't really give, I can't really give times for waiting lists. If you're an older person, um, and you've been through our service many times before, not that you're any less worthy or in need, you would, you would not be seen as quickly as a 14 year old first presentation because of that window of opportunity of treatment. And because of financial and economic restraints on our service, it's a very small service. Okay. I've, got, I've got someone called um, Helen Gibbs. She's saying that she talks about the voice often regardless of age. But she's also saying that she can speak to Health Pathways in Southern. So is she related to your team, Helen Gibbs? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, interesting. Why, why, what, I, I, why can't she talk to Health Pathways? She can. She, I think she means that she can actually give information about the Health Pathways in Southern. So I think what she means is if someone is in Southern, they can contact her for information around the health pathways. They should, they should all be able to contact community health pathways because I think that's accessible. Mm. I presume it was accessible throughout the South Island, community health pathways. There are two, there's hospital health pathways and community health pathways. So these should be quick fire ones because you did say you know them all. So we've got someone we'd like to know who the regional liaison is for West Coast please. Um, it's Pamela. Pamela. No, I can't remember her surname. That's really bad. I have got it right here. It is Pamela Mitchell. 
Thank you. And while you've got your book at the ready, and we'd also like to know the person, the public liaison person for Southland, please. In Vicargo. Is that in Vicargo? I think Southland in Vicargo. Yeah. Oh, North Island. I think it, if, if it's in Vicargo area, I think that is Southland. It's Kate McLennan. Thank you. Um, and then we've got here, how best to support people in their 50s to 70s who have chronic eating disorders? Got some coming through into aged care. Okay, so, so that is going to be the focus of my next webinar. Um, the severe and enduring are a slightly more complex and you're looking really, I guess, I, I don't want to get into this tonight, a better illness management plan led by their own goals. Yeah, slowly, slowly goals led by themselves is the best way. Thank you. Um, should you do surprise ways because you might be able to get a truer weight. Mm. If given warning of weight in advance, they can secrete weights, load up with fluids, et cetera. Yeah, um, what we do here on the ward, if we suspect an inpatient is falsifying their weights, and we have a whole collection of weights that we've gathered in our outpatients' toilets that have taken um, refuge in people's underwear for weighing. Um, rice sewn into underwear, weights, water loading, um, how would you spot weigh if you're only seeing somebody every now and then because weighing is really part of every appointment treatment so how would it I'm not sure how it would be a spot weight but if you can yeah thank you now I've got two similar ones here that says the wait time for the SIEDU is to see patients that they can have accepted after referral is about four to five months what can we do for our patients in the meantime, other than medically monitor, try to support them? Can you just repeat what was that? What was the first bit of that? The SI, South Island Eating Disorder Service. Is that SIEDU? Yeah. Yeah. So they're saying that the time that people are waiting from referral is four to five months. Mm. Four to five months. And so they're wondering what they can do in the meantime to support these patients. I've got two people asking that sort of similar question and um, what, they, what advice they can do, recommendations for patients. So is, and is, families. Um, are they waiting for assessment by our service? Is that what they're meaning? They're waiting for an assessment. Yeah. 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 Um, so yes, so we would write to the GP, let them know we've re received the referral and the GP will be responsible for the ongoing medical management. There is a very useful web, uh, web uh, organization called EDANS, E-D-A-N-Z, um, which supports, if you're talking about families, this is a really good website, but they also provide information of how to support people. So what you're looking really is, is if it's a young person to get the parents on board to feed their children. Um, but yeah, sometimes kids, get really sick and have to be hospitalized whilst they're waiting for us. It's not what we would choose, but it's what okay. happens. In order to have ongoing training and support for inpatient services, should we be contacting the regional liaison person? Yes. Or me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but probably best, I mean, I think, I think it would be great if these people out there could liaise with their regional liaison person. It just leads to a fuller service and that they always know when we're going down to do a presentation. So we do trips um, to each of our areas twice a year to do presentations and education. So if, if these people know that this is happening because they're linked in with their regional liaison person, they're going to get the benefits of that. Thank you. Um, this one here says they've got a patient with autism who is always throwing up after eating, but not doing it on purpose, says he is, in, he is not purging. What could possibly be a reason for this happening? Could it be an eating disorder? Any guidance on where to send this patient, please? Mm, that's complicated. It may be, um, I guess it, it will depend on whether he's actively trying to lose weight, how old he is, if he's got, um, you know, if he's got some adverse 
worries about eating or, or maybe he's choked in the past maybe he's vomited maybe yeah those adverse consequences are, are fearful for him autism is, is a very complex diagnosis to go alongside an eating disorder I yeah I'm sorry I don't really have the answer I mean here we would look at a bit of exposure therapy gentle exposure therapy um, we've had somebody as an inpatient quite recently from down south somewhere who had um, yeah, uh, he was on the spectrum somewhere and could only eat white foods. Um, so we introduced a few different yellow foods. Um, it's quite quite a difficult um, yeah thing to address. I think it's a slowly, slowly approach. So where would you be recommending they would be best to approach first then? The person with the autism, I, I would be saying the community mental health team. It depends if they're a, a, a young person or an adult or. Yeah, it sounds like the, yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah, we don't actually know, in, but no, they're just, so maybe start with the community mental health team, depending on the age of the person that they're dealing with. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and there are useful um, supplements such as Fortisip and Ensure that they could use to sort of reestablish <coughs> safe. Um, parameters if he's if he's looking medically unstable. Here's another one that you will to quick fire. Who is the liaison person for South Canterbury? Jackie Keane. There you go. See, <laughs> you'd win the pub quiz. <laughs> Jackie Jackie is a wonderful lady who works for the community mental health team in Timaru and has been our regional liaison person. Oh well, at least as long as I've been here, which is twelve years. <laughs> A good bit of teamwork going down, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's good. It's good. We have good liaison with with all our districts, and we need to because it's become so much more complex. Um, yeah, it's just really important that we liaise. Well, no, that's fantastic. Thank you, and thank you for providing all those links for people. Hopefully, they've got their cameras out and taken a picture of the screen, so yeah. they'll have all the contact details for people as they go ahead and. Thank you very much for your time this evening. For someone that doesn't like talking to a screen, you've done amazingly well. Beautiful presentation. You can see the amount of work and enthusiasm you put into your job in general. And thank you for all the effort you put into your slides this evening to share that information with people across um, the South Island. Um, very much appreciated. Thank you. That's a pleasure. Thank you.